We begin with developments from China. President Xi Jinping is looking at a busy weekend. He'll host U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, a very significant meeting that the world will be watching closely. But before that, Xi Jinping will have another visitor, Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft. Gates is traveling to Beijing. The meeting is scheduled for tomorrow. Now, had it been any other country, it may not have been such a big deal. Most world leaders regularly meet business titans. But Xi Jinping is not your regular leader. Also, this meeting is less about business and more about image correction. The Chinese president is in urgent need of that. The pandemic ruined whatever was left of his reputation. Then he shut himself away from the world and unleashed his wolf warriors. That isolation and offensive approach backfired. So now he's busy repairing the damage. Also, China's economy is in dire straits. Investments have dried up. Businesses are wary of operating in China. The country is increasingly seen as less welcoming. Repeated crackdowns and erratic policies are causing losses. Companies are moving out of China. And you know all of this. Well, so does the Chinese leadership. Hence the meeting with Bill Gates. It's expected to be a charm offensive to change the world's perception about China. But here's the thing about perception. It cannot be built or changed overnight. So one meeting may not be enough to restore trust. But it can be a significant start. And we'll tell you why. Bill Gates is already in China. He says this visit is about the Gates Foundation. That's his non-profit organization, the Gates Foundation. He'll see Xi Jinping on Friday in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. They've not shared the agenda, but the choice of Bill Gates is a well-thought-out one. He's revered in China as an entrepreneur. So this affair will get a lot of publicity. Official photographs are expected. Chinese mouthpieces are expected to amplify every detail of the meeting. They're already at it, in fact. Look at this post from Global Times. Bill Gates was warmly welcomed in China. He joins a stream of U.S. billionaires visiting China, even as U.S. continues to adopt a hostile approach. Classic Chinese propaganda, always playing the victim card. The West is hurting us, they say, but China is still open for business. That's their message. Slight problem, though. The world sees through it. The Chinese state is in crisis mode. In recent weeks, urgent meetings have been convened in Beijing. Senior Chinese officials are holding talks with business leaders and with economists. They want advice. China's technocrats are unable to revive the economy, so they're looking for ideas. The list of challenges is growing. Economic growth has slowed. It's fallen to its lowest levels in 40 years, four decades. Youth unemployment is at a record high, and the real estate sector has more or less collapsed. So Chinese officials took these problems to experts, and here's what they were told. Change your approach, make policy changes, and let the market decide what's best. Stop issuing diktats from Beijing. Xi Jinping seems to have got the message too, and he's signaling a shift. A shift away from draconian policies like zero COVID and aggressive crackdowns on businesses. There are also attempts to woo back foreign investors. Xi's lieutenants have been holding meetings too. The likes of Elon Musk and Tim Cook. They visited China recently. Last month, Musk met with the Chinese vice premier. The Tesla founder left with an assurance. Beijing told him that they'll continue to open up and create a better environment for his business. Apple CEO Tim Cook was told the same thing, that China will open up, and now it's the turn of Bill Gates. When he meets Xi Jinping tomorrow, Beijing is expected to stick to the same message. But you see, messages help only so much. If you don't walk the talk, it makes no difference. What's the most important economic grouping in the world? Would you say the G20? A group of 19 countries and the European Union. It represents almost all major economies in the world. But does it represent changing world realities? What about the G7? It's an old, rich nations club representing the global north. But no India, no China, no Russia. So can it really be called important in today's global landscape? Then we have BRICS. A group that represents over a quarter of the world's GDP, more than 40% of the world's population. Its members are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Now, more countries want to join. Egypt has formally applied. Others from Asia, Africa, and Latin America are also in the queue. But now there's been a surprising knock on the BRICS door. France. President Emmanuel Macron wants a slice of the action. He wants an invite to the upcoming BRICS summit in South Africa in August. 
Here's why. Does France want to join BRICS? Is Paris sending its love to the Organization of Developing Nations? Is this a sign that BRICS is entering the big leagues? While it's possible, it's still too soon to be sure. Here's what we know for certain. Yesterday, French media reported that Emmanuel Macron had a request. He wanted South African President Cyril Ramaphosa to invite him to the upcoming BRICS summit. The 15th annual BRICS summit is taking place between the 22nd and 24th of August. It's being held in the South African city of Johannesburg. Leaders from the five BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, will be present. We're talking about presidents and prime ministers. Along with these five nations, there will be other guests, the friends of BRICS as they're called. Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Indonesia have all been invited, as have some other nations. Many are hopeful about becoming members. Reports say some 14 countries have applied to join the grouping. The latest application is from Egypt, and some Egyptian corporations are excited by the prospect. It's absolutely one of the main assets uh, that, that we can take advantage of by, by joining BRICS and by joining the new development bank. We need to facilitate our trade, wh whether in import and export. And one of the things that hinders this supply chain and this process is the availability of foreign currency. Egypt may have a leg up on the competition when it comes to joining BRICS. You see, the BRICS nations have a bank the new development bank headquartered in Shanghai. There are four non-BRICS members, Bangladesh, Egypt, the UAE and Uruguay. Bangladesh expects to be given membership in August. Egypt will be hoping for it too. It will mark a new phase in BRICS. So far, the group has only allowed one country to join after its formation, South Africa, which joined in 2011. BRICS doesn't really have a proper mechanism to induct new members, but they're working on it. Looking at institutional development of BRICS or uh, expansion, uh, we uh, have concluded that we haven't as yet uh, got what we believe is a useful uh, document uh, that we could place before uh, the heads of state. So more work will need to be done on this matter. Uh, it is still uh, to be processed. And once uh, we have a document that we believe offers clear uh, guidance. We will then take that to the summit uh, in August. And the group does seem keen to expand, especially in light of the war in Ukraine and the resultant sanctions on Russia. BRICS member countries want to get together and find a common currency they can trade in, find a way to bypass the US dollar. That's part of what's fueling the expansion. Another reason is the need for economic development. While the West is focusing on the war, the eradication of poverty seems to have been left by the wayside. I believe the enlargement of the BRICS will be beneficial to the BRICS countries, beneficial to developing countries, and to increase the representation influence of this mechanism, and also to uh, garner a bigger uh, power of the BRICS to serve the interests of developed countries and the emerging market economies, as well as the international uh, development course. China is definitely pushing for the expansion of BRICS. It's another way that Beijing can increase its global footprint, another forum where China can help steer the agenda. Which brings us back to France. Macron went to China in April. He wanted Europe to follow a course independent of the US. He wanted to maintain good relations with Beijing, especially when it came to trade. Is the BRICS summit just another platform for Macron to peddle his politics? Or is it something even more underhanded? Russia has asked France to explain Macron's invite. Moscow asked if it's some sort of Trojan horse move. While we wait for the reply from Paris, one thing is certain. BRICS is increasingly becoming a crucial platform on the world stage. We're counting down to Prime Minister Narendra Modi's state visit to the U.S. There's a lot on the schedule. The Prime Minister will attend a state dinner. He will also address the U.S. Congress. There are ev events tailored for the cameras, very high on symbolism. But those may not be the high point of this trip. That could be a defense deal. The U.S. and India are expected to sign an agreement on jet engines. Reports say it's close to the finish line. What exactly is in the deal? Well, two parties are involved. 
like in most deals, General Electric, which is a US multinational, and Hindustan Aeronauticals Limited, HAL, which is an Indian defense firm. The deal is basically joint production. GE will transfer technology to HAL. HAL will then produce the engines in India. They could be used on the homegrown Tejas jet. But what's in it for both sides? For India, of course, the gains are tangible. Your domestic defense industry gets a big boost, which means more jobs, more cutting-edge technology. India can replace its aging fleet of jets. And what's in it for the Americans? Well, a defense deal with India. The U.S. has been trying to reduce India's dependence on Russian arms. Historically, most Indian equipment has been Soviet or Russian. So this is a big change. Washington will see it as a sign of deepening relationship. Now, to be clear, this is a major shift for both countries. In the past, the U.S. has refused to share critical technology with India, like GPS during the Kargil War. India needed it. The Americans refused. Same with nuclear submarines. Washington repeatedly refused to help India. In the end, New Delhi had to turn to Russia for the subs. The jet engine falls in the same category. It is highly advanced and critical technology. Only four countries have aced it. The US, Russia, France and the UK. Even China buys jet engines from Russia. So sharing this technology requires jumping through a lot of hoops. The Commerce Department must clear it. The State Department must clear it. The Pentagon must clear it. And finally, the US Congress must approve it. Only then can jet engine technology be shared. Now, American officials seem confident that all of this will be done. In fact, that's one reason US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan visited India. He was in New Delhi this week. He spoke very specifically about removing obstacles to technology transfer. Listen to what he said. As we look ahead to the state visit that Prime Minister Modi will be uh, embarking upon in Washington next week, along with Ajit Doval and a significant delegation from India, a number of the deliverables at that visit are not just bullet points on a page. They are fundamentally designed to remove those obstacles in defense trade, in high-tech trade, in investment in each of our countries, in taking away obstacles that have stood in the way of better collaboration among our scientists and researchers. So I guess the old wariness is gone. The U.S. now wants to share critical tech with India. And it's not just engines, not just jet engines. Yesterday, we t told you about a drone deal, how the U.S. was urging India to clear it. New Delhi has done that now. The Defense Acquisition Council has given its approval. The deal is likely to be announced during the Prime Minister's trip. We don't have the specifics, but reports say 30 Predator drones for $3 billion. That's what India is looking at. What explains this American eagerness, this U-turn, from the last decades. In two words, geopolitical realignment. The US needs India on two fronts. First, to contain the challenge from China, and second, to isolate Russia further. And that wasn't the case for most of the 20th century. And it's not just the US. Other Western countries are also joining in. Earlier this month, Germany struck a deal with India. ThyssenKrupp will jointly make submarines with India's Mazagan Dog. All of this is good news. Relying heavily on one seller is not ideal for any country. In 2022, around 45% of India's arms came from Russia. Five years back in 2017, this was 62%. So you can see the shift here. India has been gradually reducing Russian imports. The Ukraine war will likely speed that up because A, Russia's weapons deliveries have slowed down and B, their effectiveness is in doubt. Having said that, let's be clear about Washington's endgame. It's not some noble effort to help India. It's a self-serving policy. So how should New Delhi plan this out? The ultimate goal should be self-reliance, to build these critical technologies yourself. Until then, such defense deals are a big help. They will boost India's domestic production. They will also help us prepare for the China challenge. 7.7 .7 lakh. That's how many Indian students went abroad to study last year. It was a six-year high, also a 68% rise since 2021. There is no denying that these numbers are big. And they're not surprising either. The aspiration of studying abroad is ubiquitous in India. Whether we like it or not, it's a lifelong dream for millions. Many Indian families want to send their children to foreign colleges, and for this, they make huge sacrifices sometimes. 
Many take big loans. Some even mortgage their homes or take loans against family jewelry because they see foreign education as a worthwhile investment. But what's the return on this investment? Well, that varies and conditions apply. In the best case scenario, the students find jobs abroad and do well. In the worst case, they don't even find the college seat they paid for. And that's happening to some Indian students in Canada. And we'll come to that. But let me also first tell you about a third scenario. They finish their education abroad. They return to India, but they don't find a job here. I'll show you the numbers. This is between 2015 and 2019. Only 22% of the students who studied abroad and returned to India were able to secure a job. So almost 80% of those students who returned could not even land a job. So foreign education can be a tricky investment. Which brings me to the story from Canada. Hundreds of Indian students have been left in the lurch. They began their overseas degrees in 2017 and 2018. By March this year, many of them had graduated. Some even got work permits. So they applied for permanent residency in Canada to become legal residents in the country, in Canada, and to work there. But instead of residency, they got letters of deportation. Do you know why? Because their college acceptance letters were fake. They may not have been aware of this. But all this while, they were illegal immigrants in Canada. What do you think happened here? The students had been scammed. They'd fallen prey to a fraudulent education counsellor in Punjab. They were given fake admission letters in exchange for exorbitant fees. The students said they were wronged. So they protested for days. And now they've finally received temporary relief. The government of Canada has decided to not deport the Indian students just yet. International students who are genuine applicants that came to Canada to study and were victimised by fraudsters will be given permission to remain in Canada. Those who were complicit in a fraudulent scheme will be held accountable for their actions and will bear the full consequences of Canadian law for their uh, illicit behaviour. A task force has been formed to look into each case, so some students may get relief, but this episode highlights a much larger problem, a big crack in the system. It wasn't just the students who were fooled, it was also the visa officials and the border services agency. And this may be a big conspiracy, but it's not a unique one. Such scams are more common than you would imagine. So-called education counsellors routinely lure students abroad. They charge a hefty fee worth tens of thousands of dollars and in return they offer fake papers in substandard colleges. And yet students approach them. They want to take the risk. Why do you think that happens? For multiple reasons. There is no dearth of world-class education in India, but getting admission is tough. India's top universities are excruciatingly competitive. Cut-off entry marks easily hit 99%. So what happens to the other students? Where do they go? In some cases, education is not even the primary goal. A foreign degree is seen as a pathway to migration. And you can blame India's job market for that. Unemployment topped 8% in the month of April in India. Graduate unemployment is even higher, about 18%. A study says 83% of Indian students believe an overseas degree will give them an edge, that it will enhance their prospects for securing a better job. So today, Indian students study across the world, Canada, Australia, the UK, the US, and these are their top choices. And Canada ranks first because it's also the cheapest of these. The quality of education is comparable, there is no language barrier, and tuition fee is lower than other Western players. So Indian students flock to Canada, and fraudulent agencies exploit some of them. As we track this latest case, we do hope it serves an, as an eye-opener for others who plan to apply. China's economic mess goes deep. Wooing foreign investors might not help beyond a point. Already, leading companies are under pressure. Look at what happened to the Volkswagen CEO. There was a shareholder meeting. Some activists turned up and they threw cake at the CEO. What were these activists angry about? Volkswagen has a plant in Xinjiang, and the activists say the company uses forced Uyghur labor in Xinjiang. In fact, more companies are coming under pressure to move their business away from China, not just Xinjiang, but elsewhere too. They're decoupling from China. 
and China's economic situation is expected to accelerate this decoupling. The latest numbers are out and they're not looking good. Production by factories has slowed in China, growth in sales is weak and unemployment is rising. In the month of May, growth in the country's industrial output fell. In April, it expanded by 5.6%, but last month, the growth was just 3.5%. Sales in the retail sector rose by 12.7%. The forecast, though, was more than 13%. So China has missed the growth target. Youth unemployment has crossed 20%, which is a record high. And this is not a temporary slump. There is a clear downward trend, one that cannot be reversed easily. Investors who were once bullish on China are having second thought. One of them is a man called Stanley Druckenmiller. He's one of the most successful hedge fund managers in the world. Before the pandemic, he was optimistic about China. Once he even described China as New York on crack. But now he has different thoughts. Let me tell you about his latest assessment on the Chinese economy, and I'm quoting, looking out 10 or 15 years, I just don't see it unless there's a change in power at the top. I think that's going to be a very undynamic economy. So this is a vote of no confidence, not just against the Chinese economy, but also against the Communist Party. And that's bad news for Xi Jinping. A strong economy sustains the Communist Party of China. Its legitimacy is tied to economic growth. As long as the people of China have economic security, they're less likely to question the party and its authority to rule the country. That is the unwritten contract, but it's now been appended. So there's discontent. People are unhappy about the lack of growth. Even Beijing censors cannot hide this. Chinese factories are facing a surge in protests. As of May, at least 130 factory strikes were recorded in China. Workers went on protest. What were they angry about? The root cause is wages. They're not getting their money. Factory owners are unable to pay salaries. Either payments are delayed or workers are being laid off without any notice, without any severance pay. In some cases, workers were simply relocated. They were sent to remote areas. How does that help? Factory owners wanted these workers to leave. They didn't want to pay them, so they made their commute to work harder by forcing them to live in far-off places. It is cruel, but the factory owners themselves are helpless. They're not getting any new business. Recently, a survey was conducted. It was done by the government of China. Over 3,000 factories across the country were covered in the survey. They reported a decline in economic activity. They're getting fewer new orders. And this is an alarming situation because factories are the backbone of the Chinese economy. China was once called the workshop of the world. Now it's struggling. It's mulling extreme measures. Reports say a stimulus package is also being discussed. The plans are not final, though. But Beijing could push a range of measures. A dozen proposals are on the table, like tax breaks, more loans for small businesses, and lowering the cost of mortgages to boost real estate. China's central bank is taking action too. Today, they slashed borrowing costs. More decisions will be taken in the coming days, but experts are skeptical. They compare the stimulus packages to antibiotics. They might reduce the symptoms, but they'll not treat the underlying issues. What the Chinese economy needs at this point is a surgery. It cannot be fixed with high-profile photo ops. Get ready to bend backwards at work, and this time, literally. And openly fall asleep in office. Just remember to do it in the Shavasan pose, because now you can give your regards to the Y break. I'm joking. But the Y break is no joke. It stands for a yoga break. And India's central government is urging its employees to take one, to do yoga at their office desks, to quote-unquote de-stress, refresh, and refocus. After all, yoga has the power to calm the mind and strengthen the body. For thousands of years, it has hooked practitioners around the world because yoga is for everyone, the young and the old, the overweight and the fit, and apparently Indian government employees too. Here's a report. This is BKS Iyengar, a world-renowned yoga exponent. It's understood that his last words were, I have lived a majestic life. Majestic. You may agree that this adjective can easily be used to describe him. Just look at his photos. He is grey-haired and bendy-bodied. So observing these pictures may affect you in two ways. 
At first, his scary suppleness is awe-inspiring, but this feeling is soon followed by despair, oozing out of most people who can't even touch their own toes. But it's not too late, because that's the beauty of yoga. It is for everyone to do, and anyone can start at any age. Now, the expectation isn't to perform Cirque du Soleil acts. Even simple yoga at one's office desk can do the trick. And that's exactly what the government of India is urging people to do. The centre has asked its employees to take a Y break. It stands for a yoga break, so employees can do yoga at the workplace. And the centre has suggestions too, some light practices which only require a few minutes of break from work, like the ones you see in these visuals. The protocol compromises of asanas or postures, pranayama or breathing techniques, and dhyana or meditation. These techniques originated in India over 5,000 years ago, but today millions across the world practice them, simply because yoga really is as healthy as people say. It requires little to no equipment, it can be accessible to nearly everyone and it's linked to wide-ranging health benefits. Yoga reduces stress and body pain. It improves sleep and cognition. Research also suggests that it improves balance, strength and flexibility. A study says that practicing yoga can help reduce fatigue in cancer patients. It can even cut the risk of the disease spreading. But that's not all. Yoga also offers wide-ranging mental health benefits. It reduces anxiety and stress and elevates one's mood. Why? Because of the mind-body connection. Yoga is an intentional practice. It requires focus from both mind and body. While exercising, like jogging, people often distract their minds on purpose. That isn't the case with yoga, and this is what makes it an enigma of benefits. This is crucial in today's day and age. Office goers complain of backaches from sitting at desks or chronic wrist pain from typing away day on day. These problems even have fancy names. Have you heard of the office syndrome? It refers to the inflammation of neck, shoulder and back muscles. A study says that 8 in 10 office goers suffer from such pain. Our work life is grueling and, ironically, sedentary at the same time. Thus far, our office desks have witnessed clawed fingers clacking away at keyboards, stacks of paper, and stashes of coffee mugs. But now they can witness something completely different, something healthy, which can save us from daily stress and physical pain. And the solution is simply a few minutes of yoga, right here at our desks. But if you don't know where to begin, we have a tip. Why not start with laughing yoga directed at your boss's jokes? After all, it could have unexpected benefits. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with India. A fire broke out at an educational institute in the national capital, New Delhi. Students climbed down the building using wires. Meanwhile, an overcrowded migrant boat capsized and sank near a coastal town of Greece. At least 79 people drowned. Some migrants were rescued by helicopter. And in Peru, a 3,000-year-old mummy has been found. Archaeologists say this could be a case of human sacrifice. Finally, what makes the 15th of June significant? We're taking you back in history. On this day in 2001, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or the SCO, was founded. It was a successor of Shanghai Five which was founded in 1996. The aim of the SCO was to focus on regional security issues. India became an observer in 2005 and a full member in 2017. We're leaving you with this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
aquí ya me dio uno. Está bastante erosionado, ¿no? Sí. 